The following program is rated E. Today on CityLine, what's trending in 2024? The next trend is going to be curvy. Okay, so let's curvy. get curvy. Because there's something curvy. really nice and generous about yes. curves. All the hottest looks and trends for home decor. It's looking like 2024 is going to be yes, a good man. year for decor. Then being subtle with design doesn't mean being boring. Were well, you still thinking about a compelling and a sexy space, yeah. right? And later, picking the perfect pot. There are a million choices in the cookware industry, yeah. and not every pan is perfect for every cook, but it is really about how you cook, how you clean, and who you live with. It's City Live with Tracy Moore. Today is amazing. See, I have to keep up with you. Welcome to City Line. It's home day. We've got a great show planned for you. We're going to show you how to go bold in your home decor. And if you're looking to buy a house for the first time, we've got what you need to know. Plus, matching the right pot to the cook for those of you who cook, all right? But we're starting off talking trends for 2024 with Shy DeLuca. Everyone, give him some love. Hi, Shy. All right, Shy. What is our first trend for 2024? Okay, so we are talking about biophilic design. I mean, this is something that we've seen probably in the last two, three years. It's something that came out of COVID, and it is something that is really in bringing joy in the nature, outdoors in. We needed that during COVID, didn't we? We sure did. Right? And I mean, it sounds very sciencey. It sounds very sciencey, yeah. but it's not very sciencey. It's green. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty. <laughs> it's pretty. <laughs> so what is biophilic design? Like I said, it's bringing the outdoors in, but it's bringing it ways in which decor brings the outdoors in. So yeah. how do we do that? That's maybe not over the top. If you want to just, you know, put your foot in, put your toe in and test dip. the water, waters a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you can do that, of course, with things like pillows. The challenge with pillows or the tip that I want to give people at home when you're doing pillows like this is if you're doing an overall pattern, something like this, bold and beautiful, yeah. you really want to have something also that is kind of uh, monochromatic and one tone to kind of balance it out. Yeah. When you have a lot of pattern, it gets very busy very quickly and you want to make sure that you do have that balance. So I love this. And of course, you can do it in other ways that aren't necessarily over the top. Things as simple as a lampshade. That's beautiful. Right? Maybe some linens. You can go as small as accoutrement for your bathroom. Yeah. And then I saw this and I was like, oh my God, I had this. Yesterday when I was picking up the stuff for the show and I put this in my cart, every woman in the store <laughs> ran after me. And I was like, where is that? I want that. I was like, it's the last one for City Line I'm taking. Can't have it. <laughs> so, He's going to be returning okay. it. Go there tomorrow. <laughs> right? But just easy ways to do it. And of course, of course, plants. Now, if you're like you and I, we kill everything. So you can do artificial <laughs> or, or you can do real, of course, ways to bring that idea, the outdoors into your space. Beautiful. I love everything about yeah. that. So now the next thing we're going to be talking about is warm, warm yep. trends. Warming up that, the, the idea of earth tones. Yes. So let's talk about earth tones. And when we talk about earth tones right away, and you know, I was saying to this before, I don't know a way to put this like nicely. People right away think poopy. It doesn't <laughs> need to be definitely. It's not about poopy. It's not about poopy. It's not dark. It's, it doesn't need to be the dark, kind of dark, rich, deep tones. It can yeah. be anything that's really earth tone. So think about what earth tones are neutrals, things that you yeah. see in the earth. Now, of course, you can go uh, with, you know, the, the kind of dark chocolates, and it's nice to have this as a grounding point. Right. You know, we talk about the darker colors being a grounding point. Absolutely have that. But it's so exciting now in terms of what we're seeing in design and, and, and accessories. Certainly pottery is a big That's thing lovely. that we're seeing. Right? Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. So it looks like that hand-done clay. But this is, I bought all, everything here is from our friends at HomeSense. So this is all from Big Box Store, right? We're not paying tons of money for it. Yeah. And it looks fantastic. You can go as small as a coffee table book. Pop a coffee table book on your uh, on your on your coffee table, and it gives mm -hmm. that idea. Things like lamps. So think about 
what a lampshade is made from. Look at the design in the lampshade. It has that, that very natural look. Or the lining and the reading in the lamp. That in and of itself also has that natural tone. Yeah. It could be something beautiful like this. We're seeing tons of this now. This is a huge trend that we're seeing in interior design. It's this kind of this old kind of clay pottery look. It looks yes. like antiqued pottery. Love this. And this is an easy way to do it. It is so on trend. It's so fantastic. And because it looks ancient, it's not going anywhere in terms of like a trending and, and being classic. Right. So it's definitely something that you can introduce in an easy way and not go over the top. They look so good. They look so natural and rustic and yes. not sort of like structured clean. Exactly. So it adds that sort of organic touch to your space. It does. Which it is looks lovely. personal. It looks personal. Right. Okay, so let's talk um, a little bit about your next trend, which is? The next trend is going to be curvy. Okay, so let's curvy. get curvy. Because there's something curvy. really nice and generous about yes. curves. Absolutely. So, you know, we have been seeing the idea of Art Deco really coming back into design, which is a lot of, I love Art Deco. What a mm -hmm. great design period. But one of the details or motifs that we're seeing in Art Deco is, of course, the roundedness. Right. Art Deco was very much about molding and being able to uh, mold metals. Metals became malleable all of a sudden. That's right. right? I'll never re forget when you gave us that history lesson. Yes. It was the first time you could actually make a curve, Correct. a circle, which is why you see it in all of the art and the architecture of the time. Right, and you yeah. were seeing it in like the car industry, so you saw yes. that malleability of things. Now, so, so how do you introduce? Now, of course, the ways this that most beautiful. people will probably do in furniture. Yeah, this the is lines lovely. and the curves in furniture. This ottoman, this boucle ottoman. So that's you know another great thing that we're seeing now is a boucle. Yeah. But look, at, it's not only the cylinder; it's the fact that it has that reading, that detail in it. Right. right? Really beautiful, really nice curvature in it. Now, we can also do things like the lamp. Yeah, so you love this lamp, oh, I love this lamp. Look at this. It's a, it's a standout piece. It's a standout piece, but it's sculpture, right? Right. But look at the curves in it. Look at the beautiful organic so nice. detail in it. Just absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't want to invest in something like that, T, you have those pieces of pottery next to you. Yeah. Again, big box stores. It has that, that, that organic feel, that wavy curvature into it. Yeah. And it really looks beautiful. It adds an extra dimension. And then finally, the clock. I mean, the, the clock. clock is round. Okay. Yes. No, that, that's kind of literal. Right. But, but it's more about the, the detail in the, exactly right. Yeah. It's more about that fanning in the clock. So it's that detail in it. So when you guys are out and you're looking for those pieces and you're trying to kind of like adhere to the trend, yeah. don't only look at the obvious things. Mm -hmm. Look at the more detailed parts in it. Okay, I love that. That has that Art Deco curvature feel in it. I'm going to add that into my space. That is very nice. Yes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about stat tiles. Yes. Let's talk um, about the tiles. So tiles, we, we know that there are different patterns you can put them in. What Correct. is hot for 2024? So we've, you know, in terms of um, subway tiles, subway tile is a classic. It's yeah. an easy, it's inexpensive, it's a classic. It's something that I say to people, I don't know what, if they say to me, I don't know what tile to do, yeah. go with a subway, subway tile. It's easy, it's classic. But it's the way in which you lay it. So if you wait, if you see the way in which you've laid it here, this is a brick lay. Mm -hmm. So it's the two plus the one below giving that staggered effect. Yeah. That is a lot more of a, that's a lot more traditional. Right. Now we're seeing the stacked look. So, yeah. oop, so rather than have it on the brick lay, we are doing stacked. So it's just one on top of the other. Nice. It gives that clean, linear feel. And what it also does is, is it cuts down on your grout lines. Because if you notice when I do the brick lay, this extra grout line here, as opposed to this line here, adds an additional grout line. Yes. If I stack them, yeah. that grout line is gone. So for those of you who have this in a kitchen or a bathroom as a backsplash, this yeah. is so much easier to clean because less grout lines, less clean, less mildew, yay. I just like how <laughs> clean it looks. Right? Like there's yeah. just something so nice with the clean lines. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's go into deep colors. Yes. So that's what we're talking about here, and this bold. is on trend. Bold colors. Yeah, bold, rich colors. Yeah. So we're seeing these beautiful, bold, rich jewel tones now everywhere, and sometimes this can be overwhelming. People yes. look at this and say, oh, no, I'm not doing my whole house in these bold, rich colors. Yeah. Ways we can do it simply. You have the chair next to you, T, yep. which is that yellow. Yellow is an easier color to introduce, and then, of course, if you're unsure, but you're like, oh, Oh, I love the color, but I'm on sure. Right. Tabletop accessories. Right. Pottery. Yes. Plates. You know, dishes. All of that. Fantastic. Gorgeous. The Portuguese. Uh, the Portuguese pottery trend now huge. Looks fantastic. Keeps that trend. Love it. It's looking like 2024 is going to be yes, a good man. year for decor. It is. It Let's is. take a break, Shai. Thank you so yeah, much. Okay. We'll be right back. Stay with us. More coming out. Coming up, the tips you need to have subtle style. 
you have to decide what's the thing I'm going to spend the most money on, mm -hmm. and then you want to build everything else around it to make sure it still shines. bold with your decor at home. Kimberly Selden is showing us how to do it the right way. Let's have a look. Today I'm going to show you how we went really bold with clients recently. You know I love carpets and I think of them as artwork so this carpet definitely makes a statement. I needed draperies that could stand up to it and the clients needed privacy as well so we've got a sheer back there and a gorgeous silk drapery fabric and let me show you what else we're going to do in this very bold living room. Okay, you guys, this is really, really heavy for me, so please be careful. <laughs> All right, a little closer, a little closer. <sighs> that was hard. <laughs> I know. Okay, so now we got a couple of the biggest pieces in the room, including this mega heavy coffee table. Thank you to the movers who've been helping. When you're trying to go bold, you can think beyond color and pattern to scale. The size of this coffee table makes it a very bold choice. The family's gonna love this. And these chairs, more like thrones, really, don't you think? Does this chair make my butt look smaller? These sconces are maybe my favorite thing in the whole world. They are spectacular. Are they lighting? Is it a sculpture? I think it's both. And speaking of bold, check this beautiful painting out. Now we're gonna style the coffee table, which is my favorite thing in the whole world. Of course you have to have books, and you gotta have bold books in this case, but I need accessories that have color, that have pop, that have style, and I love to include pieces of artwork like the accordion folded pages in the acrylic box. Additionally, we're adding more pattern, believe it or not, on the sofa. I've got these pillows that have a great pattern. The end table with the marble is another great pattern. And you can see once you get enough pattern happening, it just feels cozy and comfortable. In this dining room, my clients who also happen to love the 70s thought we want to give a little nod to the 70s without overdoing it. We don't want to live in a museum. So I found this buffet. It's perfect. Lava stone acid etched. That's 70s, right? Neon lights. Look at that. Backlit. That is such gorgeous artwork and it really plays nicely off the black and white bonsai tree. And somehow once I set the table, still didn't have that 70s vibe. So I was thinking, what if every charger was kind of psychedelic and fabulous? Aren't these pretty? The sculptural impact of this long aerodynamic light fixture really makes this space feel cozy. When you're going to go bold, the other thing I want to talk about is open spaces. So this living room is bold, but it's also open to a dining room that needs to match up a foyer and an office. So you can't do it all in little bits and pieces. You kind of need a plan for the whole space, even if you need to phase it in in terms of budget. Make your selections all at one time and then phase it in as you can. And the last tip I want to give you is this. Be fearless when you are thinking of going bold. The bigger and bolder you make it, the better it's going to turn out. Trust me. <laughs> and here she is now, Kimberly Selden. <laughs> Just being oh silly. God. Hello. So that Hi. place, uh, amazing. You I, had a hard time leaving there, didn't you? I totally did. I still have the keys, and I know when they're on vacation. And I'm not <laughs> saying I'm having a party, but I might. You might. I'll invite you. So listen, that was all about bold style. It was so beautifully done, and everything worked together. But now we're actually going to do the flip side of that. We're going to talk about. Subtlety, as I'm a, such an example of in my head to toe orange. <laughs> well, you can definitely tell who the star of the show is. I love you, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So no. let's, let's talk subtlety. When you say being subtle in your decor, it does not mean being boring or being dull. No, and where I see this showing up often is kitchens. People mm. go for the all white kitchen, which feels like a good value investment if you're gonna sell your home. Yeah. But 
but before you sell your home, you're going to live there. Yeah. So yes. you want to pair things back to create calm and quiet and peace, like in the kitchen that we have, uh, for example, right here. Mm -hmm. But you don't want it to be so tone on tone white beige gray yep. that it feels like an institution. Right. And in fact, you know, often we have clients who are like criminal lawyers or ER nurses. I thought you were going to say they're criminals. <laughs> <laughs> we may like, have those too. Law? Yeah. Are you in decor? Right, right. But you lead this hectic life, and yeah. so they specifically say, I want a home that feels calm. Right. And the go to often is everything will be white and beige. But that's not actually comforting. It feels uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. you want some things to ground the space, like the dark bar stools, like a dark yeah. floor, right? Right. If that becomes really important. You need some grounding or it's just there's no place for your eyes to land. Exactly. Um, and exactly. I think that that is, you also don't want it to feel cold. You you, you don't want uh, it to be cold. Uh, no, especially because we live in a country where half the year it, it's physically it's cold, right? Yeah. But something else that can be helpful, when you're thinking about creating a space that's subtle, you're still thinking about a compelling and a sexy space, yeah. right? So you want to use negative space okay. around you. So yeah. that so that would be glass, like a glass coffee table, mm -hmm. or in this case, a, a plexiglass uh, bar cart. That is good. Such a useful piece of furniture, by the way, because yeah. you could put towels on that for the bathroom, spices yes. for the kitchen. Here we've got it as a bar. But what I love about it, too, in a living room is it allows other things in the room to shine. Right. So, for example, when you're going to invest in a beautiful carpet like the one we have here, yeah, I, went to, I went to Weaver's Art, I told you this already, but yeah. I called them and said, can you pick up a coffee table for <laughs> me and the carpet and they said no problem because I wanted to make the point when you invest in a beautiful carpet like this yeah nothing should steal the scene from the carpet right 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 so you have to decide what's the thing I'm going to spend the most money on mm -hmm. and then you want to build everything else around it to make sure it still shines that's right right you we're not trying to cover up this rug it no. is art very it's, nice right Okay, let's talk about going dark. You right? say do not be afraid to go dark, even if you're looking for subtlety. I love dark spaces. Yeah. I am attracted to spaces that are dark. It's like yeah. an infinite night sky. In the desert, you're looking up oh, at a blanket nice. of stars. It goes forever. Yeah. That's how it feels. So it's actually contrast that makes a space feel smaller. Mm -hmm. So with subtlety, you want to avoid contrast, whatever palette you're working in. This is an yeah. all black kitchen. Yeah. It's in a, um, what do you call those things? Skyscrapers, downtown Toronto. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> big, tall condo. Right. right. So you, yep. know, you leave for work, it's dark. You come yep. home from work, it's dark. It works really well. Well, dark yep. colors work well in a space where you're watching TV. They yep. work really well in a bedroom. Mm -hmm. They work really well when, it, also when you want to create a really calm, quiet atmosphere. And I love to play a game called hide the oven. Can you find the oven in this picture? Is there an oven in There's there? There's an oven. There's also a refrigerator on the other side, hidden behind the cabinet with a shutter like door. The sh oh my god! Right, because who needs a reminder that you don't know how to cook? I don't, <laughs> I don't need that. I don't need that in my it's life. It's so clean. I love it, but you have to get an electrician to give you a kill switch every time that door shuts. Absolutely. That's very, very important to stay yeah. safe. So, so That's stunning. Bedrooms can yeah. be great places to have a dark spaces as well. I agree. You're you're shutting off there. You want it to be calm. You want it to feel like you're enveloped. Yeah. It's kind of cozy. Yeah. Dark does that. It can be sexy. Yeah. I also like to create subtle tension sometimes. So mm. we've got in this bedroom we've got gold drapes but everything mm. else is kind of silver. So you know how we're mixing metals? Yes. The same thing is true if you want to create a subtle tension yeah. to mix those yellows and golds can be really interesting. Oh, I like you that. Don't have to we go do it too, too far. Do it in decor. Why not? Exactly. Let's talk patterns, because most people would say patterns, and it's like, well, you're not, that's not, there's nothing subtle about a pattern. Right. But there is subtlety in pattern. Our beautiful carpet is yes. a subtle pattern. Beautiful. Now, this is a home office we did for clients. This is one of my favorite spaces of all times. The walnut is a pattern. It's got a linear cut walnut there. And then we've that's got these stunning. sliding doors, which we've wallpapered. Yeah. And the doors actually open up to reveal all the hidden parts of the office. The printer, your files, right. your vodka, whatever. <laughs> We're not judging. Whatever well, you need to get through the stuff. day. The ugly stuff. Maybe but, you don't want people to see. Right? right? But when people come over, you shut that door and yes. it all disappears. Like, I love, love, love. Yeah. And another um, place that I love is this kitchen we did where we also used wallpaper to just kind of like... Come here. Mm. It's subtle, right? Without it, you have a white-on-white -white kitchen, mm -hmm. which is, you know, 
yawn, capital yeah. yawn. Boring. Boring, right? Yeah, so unless you're an influencer, and apparently that's what you need. Is that <laughs> they what they all need? have all white kitchens. Well, they probably have been given. How did they do that? They probably have been given white things from white sponsors. Maybe. People who sell white tiles and white. Right? So like, they have so, to keep it all white. It's almost yeah. like you need like that background to disappear. But I agree with you. It can yeah. get it can get a bit boring with every single person has the same kitchen. Oh my god! Like where are the other colors? Like yeah. come on, right? So wallpaper, area yeah. carpets, artwork. Those are places you can get subtle pattern that create interest. Yes. And and just draw you into a space. Right. Absolutely. That's what becomes important. I love that. Okay, let's talk about quiet being subtle. Yeah. So you can have quiet decor that's subtle decor. Yeah, but it can be too quiet. But it can be too quiet so, too. Right? <laughs> so then the antidote to that is to have texture. Got so it. this is a farmhouse we did in the Creamore area and she wanted this stone wall. So we use this as the fireplace. We use this as Beautiful. the backdrop in the kitchen. There's yeah. not a lot of it. But it really, it's, just enough. it's compelling, right? Yeah. And, and she's got these exposed shelves, and that kind of reminds me, you know, if you have a friend with exposed shelves, yeah. do not give them mugs with cartoon characters and funny <laughs> sayings. They have nowhere to put them. You're ruining their and, life. Right, you have yeah. to be disciplined if you're gonna have things exposed. Otherwise, you create visual chaos when your goal is to create calm and quiet. Absolutely. Right? Really, really good, really Kimberly. Important. Thank you for the bold and the subtle. Let's go to break. We got more coming out. Stay with us. Coming up, tips for first time homeowners. Any other tips you want to give us about uh, what we need to know about buying that first home? Just get in the market. Get in the market. <laughs> home congratulations it's very exciting but also somewhat daunting so if you're not sure where to start don't worry we've got you covered we've got tips for first-time home buyers with the one and only realtor Rizwan Malik Hi, everyone. hello so let's start at the start okay yes. a common misconception is that mortgage pre-approval you get that mortgage pre-approval and a lot of people think this is firm, this is binding. You've got news for us. Yes, it's not always, it's never the case. It's never uh, the case. It's not worth the paper it's written on. A pre-approval huh. is a suggestion. It's an indication to you from the bank saying if everything else pans out and your income and your, the debt you're carrying and everything else is perfectly fine, this is what we're able to commit to you. This is what we're willing to comfortably loan you mm -hmm. and go, on, go in on this investment together. Okay. But... A firm and final approval only comes into place once there is a property in place, because that's a huge component. Yes, you are one part of this transaction, mm -hmm. but the home is the other part, because the bank is still buying this home with your, or is investing into this home, and let's face it, in all cases, the bank has more skin in the game than you do. Right. Right, you have a down yes. payment, and they're giving you the rest of it, 80%. Yes. Right? Or so more So what are they some looking cases. for? So let's say, so you got your pre-approval. You're like, okay, I'm pre-approved for half a million dollars. I'm going in like late 1990s terms because <laughs> we all know that those days are Tracy, over. Tracy, I wasn't born then. Uh, oh, I'm kidding. God, get out! No. I'm joking. I was. I was, I was running around. <laughs> um, okay, so you get approved for half a million dollars. Yeah. Then you go and you find your home. What is the bank looking for in that home to guarantee that you're still good for that half a million dollars? Well, they want to make sure that the, the home is worth it. Like, let's say you're mm -hmm. on offer night and the house is worth $300,000 or $200,000. For example, we're living in this fake world <laughs> that you've fake. created for let's us. Let's go fake. It was um, good times. But then you got emotionally invested. And now yes. instead of, like, uh, the property being uh, uh, being worth three hundred grand, you are now in with five or six or ten other offers and you got emotional. You really saw oh. your life there with your kids and you're like, you know what, I'm going to offer you 400000 mm -hmm. The bank is going to say, listen, we were willing to give you half a million, right? You spent 400000 amazing, mm -hmm. the house is worth 300000 So Tracy, I'm sorry, we can't close, the, we can't bridge the extra 100000 that you spent emotionally. Right, because they're right. like, You're, that house is not worth the It's not worth that. So thousand. that's why that's why the property component yeah. is very important. It doesn't come into place. A firm approval does not come into place yes. until there is a property in place because yeah. they have to appraise it and make sure that in, in the off chance that, let's say, you know, you default on the mortgage, mm -hmm. they're going to have to sell the home. 
the bank is in the business of lending money, not carrying real estate. Right. Okay. So when they do sell this home, they want to make sure whatever they put into it, they get out. Fair. That's fair. Okay, let's talk about credit rating. How yes. important is your credit rating when you are trying to get approved for a mortgage? It's, I mean, it's, it's a single component. It's yeah. like an ingredient for the full recipe, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it depends on what your debt to equity ratios are. Like, how much debt are you carrying? Do you have student loans? Did you default on your student loans? Are your, are your, is your phone bill always paid on time, mm. right? Like, these are things that really, really factor your credit rating credit score. Yeah. But when the bank is looking at it, they're looking at, okay, well, you know, Tracy makes $500,000 a year or a million dollars a year, she's trying to purchase something that is $15 million, might be a little difficult. Mm. But on that same salary, if Tracy's purchasing something for $5 million, based on these ratios, yes, she can go ahead and pay for it. But what if her credit's bad? They will turn a blind eye to certain certain things, right? Like, okay, so I'm making a lot of money. I bought a house that's reasonable. My credit's not the greatest. They might still as long as, let it yes, go through. Yes, because, you know, when, when the bank is lending out money every day, let's say I am a high-risk borrower yeah. right like my my credit score isn't the greatest and like my income isn't the greatest and all that stuff but they're like you know what we'll take a risk here because tracy's a safe bet she makes a million dollars she's not going to default we can't have both of them defaulting but yeah. if one of them does or if you know three people out of the thousand mortgages that we're going to write okay it's the cost it's okay. of doing business it's a risk you're willing to take got it P keep putting out that million dollar a year salary into the universe please <laughs> i'll please see you while i listening just keep saying it yeah. i love that i think the real estate experts are like going to follow suit with that I salary that. right i yeah. love that yeah. okay while we're talking about mortgages a huge hot topic right now is variable versus fixed so we hear people talking about this endlessly yes. is there a white right way to do it you know what, at the end of the day, it depends on what your comfort level is. Yeah. Because for a lot of people, it's like, you know, I want a fixed rate mortgage because now my payment will not change for that term that I've signed up for, whether it's a year, two years, three years, five years. It, it's plug and play the first day of every month or whatever your date is. This money is coming out of my account, so that's fine. Yeah. I'm okay with taking a bit of a risk. Yeah. So, you know, variable, because typically variable rates, rates are better and whatever. They're so lower. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you know, people are like, you know what, I will benefit, but then... You can still lock that in along the way. But if you started with a fixed rate, the rate, the term initially will be a lot lower. But, you know, you can lock it in as you see rates inching up. If you're, if you're open to taking a little more risk, keep it variable and lock it in. You won't get the best rate, but it'll, it won't be the be-all, end-all. Yeah. But you'll benefit from saving a lot from the, in, in, like, the beginning part of it. So your advice is maybe for the first couple years go variable? Yes, and well, then... especially right now. There's yeah. still so much uncertainty. And rates are slowly. Yes, rates okay. are slowly starting to creep down. So, you know, and then I think in the next year, year and a half, we'll be in a totally different landscape. Yeah. Lock it in then. Any other tips you want to give us about uh, what we need to know about buying that first home? Just get in the market. Get in the market. <laughs> okay. It's, it's super important. Let's also talk closing costs. Yes. Okay, so there are a lot of sneaky little costs in there that you wouldn't really think about until you get to the end of the road. What are yes. we looking at in terms of closing? Yes. So certain things you want to always budget for and keep in mind, you've got your legal expenses, Everyone knows that. Yep. You need a lawyer to close, close the deal. Land transfer taxes, this is one thing that comes up in my career again and again and again, and people don't factor those in. I mean, we're in Toronto, and Toronto is the only city in all of Canada that has double land transfer taxes. So yeah. the province is like, we want to cut, and the city says, well, we want one too, mm -hmm. right? But there are rebates that are available to you. So, yeah. you know, in, this, in, the, in, in Toronto, if you're purchasing, you get between both, uh, between provincial and municipal land transfer taxes, you get $8,475 back. So it's, it's, it's something, yeah. right? It's, like, it's an incentive to say, listen, your next house will ding you twice, but on this one, okay, we'll like give you a little bit of a rebate. We'll give you, we'll cut you some slack. The other thing is you suggest getting a, a home inspector into that home to figure out if things are going to go sideways if you decide to do a reno, because those yes. costs, that's going to run up your bill quite a bit if you've got significant things to fix. Absolutely. Well, you're, you know, in, in most cases, you're already house poor when you're walking in the door. Yeah. Right? Like, like you know, and, and that, that's, that's not, that's the reality. But buyer beware doesn't necessarily apply to home ownership. Mm -hmm. Right? So you can't just be like, seller can't be like, well, buyer beware. Well, technically, you know, when, when, when it comes to like, you know, you need to do your own due diligence yeah. at the end of the day. You want, you need to be able to go in. If the, if the sellers are purposely hiding things if there are like latent defects if they have a leaky like a basement that floods or there's mm -hmm. mold and like they've put some new drywall up and just painted it quickly and threw in a bunch of boxes as a storage room so no one sees the perimeter or like you know the moisture on the walls 
that's something you can go back and litigate and sue for, but who has time? You've already purchased a Who's home. Who's got time or money for that? Yeah, your goal is going to be like, how do I dry out my basement? Okay, let's start digging the side of the house, yeah. or do I go pay a retainer and hire a lawyer? Rizwan, thank you so much for the information. My Very good, and good luck to everyone out there buying their first home. Let's go to break. we got more coming up. Stay with us. Coming up, I find my kitchen soulmate while talking pots. I love the idea of cooking. I'm pretty new at it still, so I'm the one burning the bottom of the pot <laughs> like you. <Yeah. laughs> She's my cooking sister. <laughs>the wrong pots and pans you just may be and in order to determine what pots are right for you you have to determine what kind of cook you are so here to help us with that is cookery founder Allison Fletcher give her lots of love welcome welcome Thank Allison you. There are so many different pots and pans out there um, and so many different price points. So what advice would you give to people who are out there looking for cookware? I think, thanks so much for having me, Tracy. I'm really happy to be here. I founded Cookery because there are a million choices in the cookware industry. Yeah. And not every pan is perfect for every cook. Depending on your lifestyle and your preferences, you can get the right pan that is going to last for years and years and years and have terrific results. But it is really about how you cook, how you clean, and who you live with. Absolutely. So you are going to who you live with. You heard that part. So you're going to help us match the cook with the pot in what you like to call cooking, cookware matchmaking. matchmaking. She's a matchmaker, but for our pots. So yeah. our audience is going to help us out with all of this. Uh, we're going to talk to Judy first. So Judy, what type of cook are you? I like to just come home and get something really quickly in the oven, 30 minutes max. Quick and, sh and dirty. She needs it done, yeah. right? right? And I think so many people are the same as Judy. So many people. Yeah. We've got all sorts of parents who are working full time, zipping to daycare, getting their kids, and they get home and they've got to avoid the meltdown. They need something That's really right. fast. In these cases, we really like a really good quality nonstick pan. Yep. Some people will tell you you shouldn't pay too much for a nonstick pan because they, you know, they only last two or three years, but these ones will last upwards of 10 years if used properly. They're made in Denmark from ScanPan and they're terrific quality. They're heavy. This is like a weapon, let me tell right? you. Sorry, Steve. But it's only ah. gonna take a couple of, it's only gonna take a couple of minutes to warm up. Yeah. You're gonna have a really, really heavy bottom, so it's gonna cook super evenly. Mm -hmm. And things are going to cook beautifully, easily, and it's gonna clean up fast. Okay, good to know. So Judy, this one has your name on it, okay? <laughs> Um, how do you? Need, how much should you be paying for a nonstick pan? You know what? The advice on this really, really varies a lot. But yeah. if you want, like, you can pay about $150 for a pan, and you can go up from there. But if you want something that's going to last, you will have to pay a little bit more. Okay. And especially if you want to use high heat, there are very, very few nonsticks that are sear safe. And okay. so if you are into using a little bit of higher heat, then you want to go with something like the ScanPan Haptique, which Ooh. is more expensive. Good to know. Okay, our next audience question. Who do we have in the audience uh, for us next? Alfred, let, let us in on uh, what kind of cooking habits you have. Uh, I love to cook. I just like to take my time, do whatever I can, just kind of be slow. Slow and easy. And Alfred, would you call yourself a bit of a foodie? Oh, I love it. I'm a huge foodie. Okay, huge foodie. good. So the foodie, what do we got for the foodie? We meet amazing, amazing people like Alfred in the store every single day who actually like want to have beautiful results, not only that taste good, but also look good. They want yeah. the perfect sear. They want something that's going to be in a beautiful sauce. And believe it or not, the pans that were recommended to us through the 60s, 70s, and 80s are still some of the very, very best pans for oh, beautiful results. Good, that's so, good to know. It's honestly the old faithful stainless yep. steel pan is often some of the best results. Alfred, I'm not sure if you use something like this, but if you want a beautiful sear on yep. your chicken, you want to be able to do your sauce in your pan and just add that to your rice, some of these are the best. These are from All Clad. They mm -hmm. are um, clad with many layers of metal. You can go with something that's got aluminum in the core, copper in the core, and the new graphite G5 in the core. And depending on the material that you've got in the core, it will be warm up completely evenly, but it will be even more responsive. Okay. And you don't have to pay a lot. 
It's about the materials that are used in the pan. Okay, so you're looking for certain materials. You're not necessarily looking for a price point, but this is going to be great for those who know what they're doing in the kitchen. That's right. Okay. That's Cause right. Because my pans that I have that look like this, they do not look that silver anymore. We can help you with that. We okay. can help you with that. Absolutely. I'm like, maybe I'm one of the people who doesn't know what she's doing. I'm sure you know what you're doing when okay. you're cleaning. Yeah. When you're cooking. When, I'm cooking, when you're cooking. It's the cleaning part, We can help maybe. you with the cleaning. Okay, next up, we're going to talk to Deborah in our audience. Deborah, what kind of cook are you? I'm a batch cooker, Tracy. I have four mm. grown children with spouses, two grandchildren, and Man, I make big meals. You know what? You are blessed. That, that <laughs> sounds you fantastic. That is amazing. That's so if amazing. you're a if you're a batch cooker, what kind of cookware are we looking for? Really, you want something that's got a ton of capacity. Yes. And something that's going to cook for several hours and maintain the moisture inside the pot. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're getting beautiful results over a long period of time. You need a heavy bottom, you need a heavy lid, and a bonus is something that's going to be really, really easy to clean, that has a bit, of, uh, that has a porcelain coating or something else that's really easy to clean. Yeah. And again, there are a variety of price points. It's about having a pot that has got all the insulation you need and really, really good construction. Okay, really good. Let's go to our final cook. We've got Anna in the audience. Anna, how do you cook? Hi, um, I love the idea of cooking. I'm pretty new at it still, so I'm the one burning the bottom of the pot like you. <laughs> <laughs> She's my cooking sister. That's right. So what do we need? What do Anna and I need in the kitchen if we're sort of new to the cooking game? The beauty of being a new cook is that we will give you all of the instruction you need uh -huh. to buy something that m might be right in your budget category. Good. And people used to talk about having a full set of cookware. You really don't need a full set anymore. You might need a really, really great cast iron pan. In less than five minutes, we can teach you how to cook with it, clean with it. It's yeah. so easy and it will last your entire lifetime. And then again, you want a really solid, solid construction pot yeah. that has two layers of stainless and aluminum for even cooking. And that's about it, huh? That's really about it. I remember when I was going off to university, you know, the cheapest pots ever and the whole set. And every, I don't even know if I have those pots anymore because every single one of them, black at the bottom, That's black right. at the bottom, black at the bottom. You know, students, we're not paying attention to anything. I'm trying to eat the cheapest thing every single night. It was pasta every single night. So that's good that now you just need two but make them high quality. Make them like, high quality. Give them maybe, if you can, to your kids. And listen, kids, you're going to have these for the rest of your life. Like, these are your pots and pans for life. And you want to th you want to think about the material. You want triple clad or tri-ply. You want a couple of layers of stainless steel for yeah. durability and easy cleaning. But then you need aluminum, copper, or even graphite for that really even cooking and responsiveness inside. Fantastic. Allison, such great information. So if you're a serious foodie who appreciates quality and versatility, the all-clad D3 triple-clad stainless steel three-quart saute pan is for you. It goes from stovetop to oven to table, plus its three-ply stainless steel construction makes it easy to care for. It's great for making a quick dinner or for low, slow cooking a la Alfred. It's valued at over $300. And thanks to Allison, you're all taking one home! It's a good pot. Thank you, Allison. You are so welcome. Very good. Let's go to Frank and we're coming up. Stay with us. Coming up. Ask the expert. Now, what question got this answer? You can always throw money at your kids. My kids are in their 30s. Yeah. I can tempt them with vacations and stuff like that. <laughs>hearing from our viewers with questions for our experts. So this question comes in from Margie and Margie says, I am wanting to transform our living room into a cozy inviting space that lures my teenagers out of their rooms for quality time, especially with my son heading to university next year. So Kimberly, and I always say her name like this because we all want to call her Kim, but her brand is Kimberly. 
So it's Kimberly. That's so important. Kimberly, what can we tell Margie about this? And I totally understand where she's going with this. I love I it when we're all in the living room, all together as a family, and it's rare. Yeah. And right? this, this is her space, and you can see I did a drawing blindfolded and upside down. It's not too bad. But I Kim. wanted to give the idea of a much bigger sectional okay. that would draw the kids out and launched into a comfortable space. Yeah. And because my drawing skills aren't so excellent, let's see. There we go. Uh, let, I'm going to show you a space so you don't have to guess. Ooh, I'm a better interior designer than a drawer. That's good. Plushy sectional, coffee table you can put your feet on. Yeah. I love the idea of these floor cushions that have the handles. These yes. are really good to be flexible and a big area carpet. So if we go back to this one over here, okay. what I would love to see is a much bigger area carpet here. Let's yep. see. Right? All the way, all the way. Super big, big sectional. Yeah. Let's get some, maybe some, you know, family gallery here. Nice. You know, maybe a little lighting on top. That's always nice. And then the piano, there's room for her to move it down. Mm -hmm. And then these two pictures need to be much closer together. Mm -hmm. They're gonna look better when they're much, much closer together. Yeah, I really love that idea of that huge, chunky, beautiful sectional. Like that's, what's more inviting than that? You know, my mother-in-law put in a swimming pool. Yeah. And the result of that is all the kids go to her house to hang out. There you go. That's what the sectional is gonna do for you. And you can st you can always throw money at your kids. My kids are in their 30s. Yeah. I can tempt them with vacations and stuff like that. You're gonna, <laughs> Whatever you're gonna, it takes. You're gonna tempt them with, yeah, yeah. And I'm here, I'm drawing some beautiful draperies. If you can't tell what these are, these are beautiful draperies. Mm -hmm. I would like to make the dining room space cozier and better for intimacy. Mm -hmm. So get some textiles in there which will create a kind of a hushed environment. Yeah. Let's get a chandelier lower. That's mm -hmm. too tall. Maybe something less formal since our fireplace is kind of rustic. Sure. It's a beautiful space. And then wall color, you know, we talked about this earlier. Yeah. I think that's too high of a contrast given the fireplace. So I'd like to see a wall color that blends a little bit better so that you create an environment yeah. where secrets can be told. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and make it cozy enough that they're just not going to leave. You might even, if your chairs aren't comfortable, you might even want to get more comfortable chairs. Whatever's going to keep them there around the table, right? Right. Like, I love, the, I love the idea of that. And actually, the the marker that you had here is that's a good color <laughs> for the wall. It's, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad right? at all. It's and like a caramel. Go. Like it's a little bit richer than uh, what you're seeing right now in the walls. Right. Just whatever it takes to make this space feel. I mean, in a perfect Holy. world, anytime you can have a round table, it's going to create more intimacy between everybody, mm. and it's more diplomatic. Nobody's at the head of the table. Mm. Everybody's an equal player. Yeah. So if you have a square space dining room and you can get a round table, that's the way to go. You can even have leaves to pull it, to extend nice. it for the holidays or whatever. Yeah. But fun, right? Very fun. Kimberly, thank you for mm -hmm. that. I hope you love that, Margie. Let's go to break. We have more coming up. Margie. You. Yes, you. I've got a seat in City Line's audience waiting just for you. Head to cityline.tv slash tickets to go behind the scenes with your favorite experts, the chance of great giveaways, plus all the unexpected fun of bringing City Line to your screens. What are you waiting for? Go click. We can't wait to see you. a live stream of what happens during the commercial <laughs> breaks, let me tell you. Fantastic <laughs> experts with all the information you could possibly need to know about everything you're into. Thank you so much to our audience at home that hangs out with us every day on City Line and this audience here in studio. Let me tell you, you are all lovely. <laughs> it is fantastic to have you here. Thank you for joining us. We will see you tomorrow, same time, same place, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Mm -hmm. Mwah.